welcome everyone for the final session of the new voices. Um, rarely has the title of an uh, lecture series been so appropriate because we have two new voices um, of the Department of War Studies, of which you will hear quite a bit in the future. I know it's always a bit of a tricky thing to make predictions in the social sciences, especially if they concern the future. But I'm very confident in this case that you will hear quite a bit from Matis Barra and Rhiannon Ems uh, in the future, in the next couple of years. So let me introduce our speakers today. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Matis Barra, who has uh, completed his MA in international relations in the last year with a dissertation on a topic that he will talk about today. Uh, I had the great pleasure of being the second marker of this exceptional work. It was uh, the highest marked uh, dissertation in the last year and uh, justified recipient of an award that I think you have been informed about already. Uh, yes. I received an email, yes. Fantastic. So the communication is working. <laughs> uh, that's great, not just, in, not just in the room here today. Um, Mati is going to talk about um, a topic which is um, very much um, concerning us in, in war studies. It is uh, related to the um, so-called military in intervention of Russia in Ukraine. And um, Matis, in his talk today, um, will provide a reading of Vladimir Putin through the lens of decolonial critique. Um, and he's using this um, entry point to make some um, potentially groundbreaking uh, comments on critical approaches in international relations. So I'm very, in very interested and very pleased to have you here as part of the New Voices series. And then we have Rhiannon M, who is a PhD student at War Studies. Um, you're in the third year right now, and she will um, provide a comment before we then open to Q&A. Mati, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, hi, hi everyone. I'm Mati Spara. Um, my PhD research looks at the history and sociology of uh, the discipline of international relations, and I focus on the 1990s. Um, but today, I'm going to give a little teaser trailer um, of my paper titled Putin the Critical Theorist, the Kremlin's Decolonial Critique of International Order and its Implications for the Study of International Politics. And this is my third time presenting uh, this paper. I had the pleasure to present this paper at EISA in Potsdam in a panel that addressed the crisis of critique in international relations. I also presented it in October uh, at Cumberland Lodge with my PhD student colleagues in the department. Um, I'm grateful that I was given the chance to present it here today in my home turf in the Department of War Studies. Um, in the past few years, I've become used to attending and organizing seminars here. So it's wonderful to experience these talks from the other side of the table, um, finally, um, especially among friends, mentors and, and colleagues. And even some of my IR theory uh, students in their first year of their undergraduate uh, studies. So I'm going to talk about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, maybe less. Um, as I said, I will give a little teaser of the argument in the paper. I'll give you guys some context of what I'm doing there, and then I'll walk you through the key moves that I make. Um, these are, first of all, what is my understanding of decolonial critique? Secondly, I'm going to talk a little bit about how decolonial critique is present in Putin's critique of international order. And thirdly, I will briefly discuss the implications of all of this to the study of international politics in general and critical international relations in uh, particular. Let's start with the context. For those of you who are not up to date with the contemporary debates in critical IR, let me give you a brief overview, uh, which maybe then helps you understand of what I'm actually doing in this paper. So it's largely agreed that critical IR is in crisis. The rise of nationalism across the globe, Donald Trump and other post-truth baddies, racism, misogynism, anti-intellectualism, inequality, poverty, and power politics are on the rise. And these phenomena are opposed to the commitments of critical theory, emancipation and a, and a better and more just world. And this appears to indicate the failure of critical international relations theory. Even worse, critical theory is also blamed for providing the philosophical basis, which is anti-foundationalism, um, 
upon which post-truth politics can, uh, can and could thrive. So critical theorists are accused of writing in an overly complex jargon that is difficult, if not impossible to understand, except if you're trained in and socialized into critical traditions. Um, it is not accessible, it is accused. Um, it also seems that critical theories such as post-structuralism, feminism, post and decolonial theory, queer theory, uh, they do not appear to offer any promising resources to address the current political problems that we're all facing. Um, and these issues have led um, scholars in, in IR and in, in other disciplines to the conclusion that critique is in crisis uh, and critical IR is at an impasse and in need of a new steam, a new, new sense of purpose. And scholars are trying to make sense of this new reality. Beate Jan from the University of Sussex comes to the defense of IR in this context and argues that critical IR has in fact been very successful. Uh, Nick McKelson, who's in this room as well, paints an even starker picture, arguing that no theoretical tradition has disappointed as much as critical IR and that we'd be better off by letting, the, letting go of the term critical IR scholar completely. So my article is swimming in these muddy waters. I try to think of the next steps for critical IR both empirically and conceptually. And I argue that Putin is using decolonial tools of critique and he's using them very sophisticatedly and that this is both a challenge and an opportunity for critical international relations. Uh, my exploration into this topic began while I was studying decolonial thought with a particular focus on Franz Fanon, I'm Césaire and uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And I know um, Mark Kondos is not here today, but thanks to him, uh, he made me read Gandhi, which I don't think I would have otherwise ever read. So I want to thank Mark Kondos for introducing me to Gandhi's, uh, Gandhi's thinking um, in his Violent Encounters in Anti-Colonial Wars uh, Master's module. So anyway, I was trying to discern the very basics of what is decolonial critique. Uh, what are the key attributes that define a critique decolonial? And around the same time, as I was reading Gandhi, Fanon, and Césaire, I was also reading Walter Mignolo's The Darker Side of Western Modernity. And quite quickly, um, and those of you who are not familiar with Walter Mignolo's work, he's one of the prominent uh, decolonial philosophers in our contemporary, um, contemporary era. So quite quickly, I arrived at the conclusion that decolonial critique, while it comes in various forms, uh, it comprises uh, three fundamental elements. First of all, it consists of unveiling Western dominance and colonial power. Second of all, it has a discourse around the meaning of indigenous cultures and traditions. And thirdly, it, has, it provides an emancipatory vision, a blueprint for a post-colonial future. And these three characteristics take different meanings, uh, different political and ethical logics for each decolonial thinker. And they manifest with different kinds of critical tools um, in their in their writing. Uh, for example, Mignolo uses the concept of epistemic disobedience, uh, what, by which he means the practice of unveiling the regional foundations of universal claims to truth, uh, categories of thought and logic that sustains all branches of Western knowledge. Um, and Fanon, for example, uses uh, uh, different kinds of tools such as turning in historical meta-narratives, turning who's the object and who's the subject of history. But I'm, I'm going to be talking about these more in depth in due course. Um, so around the time I was reading these decolonial thinkers, I noticed that Putin's critique of uh, international order at its core appeared to embody these very basic characteristics. And I also remembered Walter Mignolo's line in his book is that theories are where you can find them. Um, and I was also interested by Putin's recent turn towards an explicitly decolonial language, as evident in his statement in 2022 at the Valdai Discussion Club and elsewhere where he's talked about these issues, where he said an essentially emancipatory anti-colonial movement against unipolar hegemony is taking shape in the most diverse countries and societies. Now, I must say that when I shared my fascination with this idea and these topics with my peers, with my friends. Some were quick to dismiss it as a, this is just mere uh, instrumental and hypocritical use of uh, decolonial language, uh, given Russia's historical and imperialistic actions. And it most certainly is hypocritical. And there's no question that Russia behaves imperialistically. Um, however, I just couldn't 
but wonder if there was more um, more depth to Putin's critique than really meets the eye. Um, Indeed, it was the idea put forward by scholars such as Vyacheslav Morozov and Isa Zarakol that Russia is simultaneously an empire uh, in its so-called near abroad, um, and at the same time a subaltern vis-à-vis uh, -vis the West. And this is what interested me in exploring this topic. So I started reading Putin's foreign policy speeches from uh, early 2000s onwards, and I found three recurring concepts. Traditional values, sovereign democracy, and unipolarity. And these concepts, I came to realize, contained a wealth of decolonially critical tools uh, that might not be immediately apparent. So I'm going to go through each concept very briefly now. First, Putin's emphasis on traditional values. It bears a striking resemblance to Gandhi's decolonial critique. Much like Gandhi, Putin contends that modern uh, modern values, modern neoliberal values are eroding tradition spirituality and duty, leading to moral decay and un unhappiness in society. Furthermore, both think to see the European masses who still subscribe to traditional values and, and spiritual values as sort of co-sufferers in neoliberal modernity. So this kind of identity politics uh, where the masses become sufferers of Western modernity is also a decolonial critical tool. Um, and in, in Putin's traditional values discourse, there are also other examples of decolonial tools, such as unveiling the parochial origins of uh, modern values and the idea that a true conception of human rights or the meaning of human rights, that these are rooted in all world religions as opposed to the European Enlightenment. And uh, this tool is very similar to what Mignolo calls uh, delinking from Western knowledge systems. Um, and Mignolo also used the concept uh, zero point epistemology, by which he means the emergence of Western epistemology as the single objective and neutral way of knowing and classifying uh, the world and its peoples and their problems and solutions according to Western theological, philosophical, economic and political logics. And Mignolo provides examples of the colonization of knowledge. Uh, colonization of knowledge by narrating how uh, Western imperial powers colonized time and space uh, during the Renaissance through powerful meta-narratives of historical progress and development. And, you know, the common story in at least when I studied in high school and in, uh, in earlier, earlier years, how the civili civilizations emerged in ancient, ancient Greece and then it moved to Rome, uh, then to Western Europe and eventually across the globe. Um, similarly, these kinds of Western meta-narratives, according to Mignolo, uh, colonize time as history is read through Western historical benchmarks of antiquity, Middle Ages, Renaissance, and so on. And that ignores the local histories of the rest of the world. And then these West-centric meta-narratives alongside the development of Western science and Cartesian rationality have then been imposed on other people around the world. And they have now been internalized in, in modernity. Uh, for Mignolo, then Western dominance finds its power from its epistemic functions as knowledge itself is colonized and subaltern cultures and their ways of knowing are rendered inferior if and when they do not follow this epistemology of the zero point. Um, a, recent ex a very recent example of Putin's use of similar kind of logic of argumentation and critique is um, took place in November when he spoke at an artificial intelligence conference in Moscow. Putin talked about how some Western search engines operate selectively and with bias, how the dominant Western algorithms may imply that Russia with Russian culture, science, music and literature simply does not exist. This kind of xenophobia, says Putin, can arise in even in artificial intelligence if it's created according to certain western standards and putin himself proposes that domestic ai models should be created that reflect the richness of world culture heritage and the wisdom of all civilization so similar kinds of tools are used by putin as um, decolonial philosophers second concept sovereign democracy um, putin's view is that while democracy is a universal principle, its meaning varies across diverse cultures and societies. Uh, and it's, the meaning is shaped by each country's and culture's unique histories and traditions. 
And this perspective um, paints a picture of Western nations intruding into the domestic affairs, propagating their values through self-interest and imperialism as they try to promote uh, demo democratic development in other societies. And this also uh, makes of this positions Russia as a defender of some sort of authentic, universally applicable democratic principles and makes Russia seem to be this kind of leading leader of a global counter revolution against Western hegemonic notions of democracy and multipolar world. Um, so this narrative that sovereign democracy creates closely aligns with the goals of decolonial theorists who seek to reveal the Western origins of democracy and liberate the concept from Western hegemony and embrace plural, plurality or pluriversality as Mignola would uh, say it. So they argue that the West, decolonial philosophers argue that the West insists on a universal understanding of democracy that can be measured and practiced according to some set criteria, but only by respecting each culture's distinct way to achieve democracy can a truly pluriversal and democratic order emerge, say the decolonial thinkers. Finally, uh, the concept of unipolarity. We often use the concept of unipolarity as a sort of state-centric concept through which the internationalists perceive to be this anarchical zero-sum playground where power begs to be balanced and great powers pursue their uh, selfish national interest. You know, Cold War was bipolar and then, then there's the more unipolar moment. And it's kind of, scholars like to use concepts like multiplex or multipolar nowadays to describe the contemporary international order. But even these concepts have different meanings uh, based on who uses them. And scholars of Russian foreign policy have a tendency to claim that Moscow's worldview is largely informed by this sort of paranoid neorealist interpretation of the nature of international politics and US foreign policy, policy in particular. And for good reason, uh, the Russian Ministry for Foreign Affairs even tweeted John Mearsheimer's infamous 2014 foreign affairs article, Why the Ukraine Crisis is the West Fault. Um, this was on February 28, uh, 2022. And the Russian Ministry for Foreign Affairs wrote on their Twitter page that the United States and its European allies share most of the responsibility for the crisis. The taproot of the trouble is NATO enlargement. Um, but I would say that this kind of realist interpretation of the Kremlin's uh, worldview and critique of the West is only one side of the coin. On a closer examination, I would argue that it's uh, their use of the concept of unipolarity is a bitter cocktail of both realist and decolonial thought. As used by Putin, unipolarity denotes a view of the post-Cold War international order as a self-interested imperial project by the United States that has unilaterally imposed Western political and economic standards on other countries and dominates them. Uh, this is a situation which has, according to Putin, nothing in common with democracy. And through the con concept of unipolarity, Putin is able to seize a subaltern subject position for Russia, rendering Russia into this revolutionary force against fighting against US imperialism, like the other concepts as well. And this is a decolonially critical move. And Putin's use of the concept resonates with Fanon's tools of critique in The Wretched of the Earth, such as changing subject positions in which the West becomes this colonial object of history and the colonized become these empowered subjects. And in these, um, in these narratives, West is often portrayed as the civilizer and the hallmark of progress and development and the rest are portrayed as passive receivers waiting to be modernized. These tables are turned um, in Putin's use of the term unipolarity. So rather than being a sort of neutral social scientific concept that describes this thing called the international system, in Putin's usage, I would argue that the concept has some deeper meanings attached to it. And this narrative creates like traditional values, sovereign democracy, uh, uh, cast Russia as this revolutionary force fighting against US imperialism. So Putin's tools, uh, Putin, uh, the tools of decolonial critique are present in these foreign policy discourses, and I would argue in quite an interesting way. They're used to justify centralization of power in Russia. They're used to justify the war in Ukraine, and they're used to limit the rights of sexual minorities. And this is a challenge for critical international relations. Critical theories and tools 
um, often thought to be used for progressive emancipatory agendas to make the world a better place for the marginalized, um, are used very skillfully by reactionaries such as Putin. Some might argue that Putin is not a decolonial ally because he's not genuine or because he uses decolonial rhetoric and concepts to justify imperialist expansion and colonial dominance of Russia's near abroad and anti-democratic policies at home. I agree that Putin is not necessarily a decolonial ally, but it does not mean that his critique of international order is not decolonial. Indeed, Putin's use of critique could very uh, well make him the most influential and impactful critical theorist of our era, exactly because of the way he uses and mobilizes decolonial theory. He also has the biggest audience, and those narratives, while they do not resonate in Western mainstream discourses, they might work in the global south, and they also serve a function in Russia as well, and in, among uh, the uh, far right in, in the West. So we're coming towards the end. My paper argues that while critical IR has so far largely neglected this darker side of critique, it is perhaps the only theoretical tradition that can fully understand it. Critical IR theory needs to gather its deconstructive methods and tools and direct its attention to the problem posed by reactionary internationalists. Um, so against the disciplinary background that I laid out earlier, um, engaging Putin and other reactionary internationalists, a critique of international order is an opportunity for critical IR and it provides it with a new sense of purpose. My proposal is that Cox, Robert Cox's famous 1981 dichotomy of critical versus problem-solving theory um, has done more harm than good, and that it's time for critical IR to reinvent itself as a critical problem-solving theory. And what should be clear, and I'll finish now, is that decolonial critical theory is not always good or progressive. It can be dark, it can be reactionary, it can be nationalist, it can be violent and used for a wide variety of agendas. Just because we don't like Putin does not mean that his critique of international order is not decolonial. The subaltern is speaking, just not the way we want it to. It is saying and doing some nasty things. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mati. Very pleased I didn't promise too much. <laughs> and with that, Rhiannon, your comments. Uh, great. I, you know, it's one of my favorite papers. I think it's great. Um, I think it's very kind of diagnostic of the way in which um, the discipline implies its own teleologies. So we think that criticality somehow has an inbuilt politics, right? Like it must be progressive and, and we get to define what progression is and about how that's not necessarily true. Um, and kind of about the worlds that we imagine and how other worlds are being imagined with the same methods. Right? Um, and how we come to terms with that because we can't presume the politics of our methods, right? Because our methods are perhaps specific to a particular um, kind of kind of political world building or to a particular political world, but it doesn't mean that they're improper to other world building. And we have to be very clear about that because if we do think, and I think a lot of decolonial theorists would say that their methods are improper to Putin's world building, you have to tell us why, because otherwise there's there's not a lot of value in that, I don't think. Um, and so it kind of takes us back to um, this idea of like a, an inherent coherent critical politics, which I don't think necessarily exists, um, and which has, as you say, kind of created this, and as Nick says, uh, this like critical identity, which doesn't necessarily align with critique. So I think there's critique as a practice and there's critical as an identity. I think they're two different things. I think you're going back with this paper, which is why I love it, um, back to what critique does, right? It goes, here is a taken for granted orthodoxy, which here is decolonial thought, uh, which I think it's fair to say struggles to hear critique sometimes. Um, and you're going, right, I'm going to take it seriously on its own terms, the same way that I think I've written down here. Uh, Orientalism and Orientalism in reverse does, and also the poverty of neorealism. So, like, to I think of the great political critiques of our time, or like theoretical critiques, I suppose. Um, the way that you read, and I think you have to read, with these people and then say, actually, you're wrong, right? Because, because of these things that are within your own text. I'm not, it's not from a political positionality, it's from a kind of 
scholarly positionality. Does that make sense? I don't know if that's a, a valid uh, division. But I think um, we have to view this crisis of critique as like productive and essential and invigorating because otherwise we are stuck with critique or critical IR that reproduces its own um, homogenizing narratives, right? So um, Orientalism produces a particular subject that cannot be cannot be challenged and then to critique that is to say actually the world is much more interesting than that and we as IR scholars should be invested in it and to be invested in the world is to see that sometimes it's a bit weird and sometimes it doesn't do the things you want it to do and that means that you get to write fun papers like this where you actually say something about what is happening rather than constructing a world that doesn't exist which I think is kind of speaks exactly to your point about Robert Cox's false to me and how the future of IR, which I guess we now have to become somehow, um, has to move away from what it is now and where it's stuck. Um, and I think that this paper is like, to me, the beginning of a brilliant career and I'm yeah. very happy to like, to speak to it and, um, and I, yeah, we'll not be redone on Twitter to defend it, I'm afraid. But uh, there we go, let's open up to questions. Um, I love the paper and I thought that it, it might be worth highlighting that the stakes are not just scholarly for IR. Let's not be provincial. Um, it might be worth looking at ANSA, uh, one of the Middle Eastern uh, English language and French language news agencies, and Canal Sur in particular, and Jeune Afrique in North Africa. Some of them are co-sponsored, like Canal Sur in Venezuela, by Russia Today. So they mirror a lot of the discourse, but it might be worth seeing how they, it's working. Putin is a colonial, anti-colonial hero, and he has managed to pick up a very specific strand of 1960s and 70s com communists, anti-American, anti-gringos in Latin America. Anything anti-gringo will get you uh, that, that level of opprobrium. And it, it's worth, I think, analyzing how Putin, this strategy is working. I mean, look at the, the Malian regime is passionate about Russia's support for its final independence against the French. That's how the new Malian president put it. That's incredible. Um, and it sets the stakes even higher than just an academic debate, I think, but rather a debate about understanding how the reactionary international is able to pick from its polar opposites. It's not the first time they managed to steal from Antonio Gramsci. And that's incredible. If they can do that, they can steal from the decolonials and anyone else. That's a that's a good suggestion. I take that on board. I think it's very very challenging in a in a single paper go through the the deep sort of philosophical philosophical side and then at the same time analyze how it's working in practice. So that's definitely uh, probably a, a spin off article idea there. So thanks very much. And also part of the critical problem solving theory, yeah. right? Uh, I just wonder whether it may be worthwhile also looking at the Russian intellectual origins of what underlies and depends what you described as the colonial critique of the Russian regime. And <clears throat> much of what you said was already stipulated in the famous influential essay of Trubetskoy, Russia and Humanity in the early 1930s. That's the Eurasianist theory, which is a strong theory of Eurocentrism, colonialism, etc. And um, as we know, these people, these networks, these think tanks, individual figures who actually write Putin speeches are well steeped into Eurasianist theory. So are you going also to look not only in Gandhi, but Russian Eurasianism and that sort of <coughs> blending of orthodoxy, autocracy, you know, all these elements which again are re-blended in this powerful uh, powerful new fusion that you described and then had a global impact which you also described. So is it worth looking also in these Russian traditions of the 20s and the 30s? Thank you very much. Yeah, in my paper I focus on, um, in sovereign democracy, I focus on Surkov's uh, conception of sovereign democracy. I, I don't go that deep into the sort of intellectual tradition, but that's definitely something very interesting that I'll, be, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll take on. and. With regards to traditional values, I go back to Narachnitskaya's conceptions. Um, unipolarity is interesting as well because it's a modern uh, sort of social scientific concept. So definitely should thicken those uh, traditions further. Thank you very much. <laughs>
that Jane Burbank has summarized some of these traditions for New York University, so it would be useful to look at some of the pieces. Thank you. Any other questions? Mati, does it make a difference that uh, Russia has a history of critical theory in practice, such as the Marxist tradition? Or does it tell us something about the hierarchies of critical approaches and how they have been picked and chosen by current imperialists? Yeah, that's interesting. I think that um, the way those are those are used is certainly that it's always like the aim is to boost Russia's great power identity and great power standing, and now it's used trying to find new narratives and new concepts to, to make that happen, where during the Cold War, it, it came from communism and that tradition of critical theory, I guess. Um, but now it's now they're looking into new traditions and uh, where, where to sort of derive those narratives. It might be coming back at Marx that he hasn't been focusing on gender. <laughs> Anyways. Thank you so much. Uh, we often discussed uh, about Russia and their um, approach. Um, I'm wondering, um, because uh, I include this theory, what I want to ask now in my research, um, theories of geopolitics, how, uh, I mean, uh, it was not uh, in the Soviet time, this widely uh, studied in Russia, but right now it's became quite uh, interesting if we see how they intensified um, talking about uh, theories of heartland, um, also Rimland, sea power and so on. Uh, do you think uh, you also can see those uh, approach as well? Because um, when we are talking about um, why Russia is behave, how they behave today, we need to find out the reason because they have their view. So I, in main, main thing for my study is democracy. Uh, but I want to also see how Russia considers this democratic development in Eastern Europe. They consider it as a Western tool against their power. So I think we need to find out how they use those theoretical tools against the West. And uh, we need to find also some kind of Solution is this way to, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, well, what you said about like combination of realist tradition and geopolitics, and then those are connected with uh, connected to decolonial critiques. It's very interesting, and um, I would say that, and in the paper, I actually go in little, not too much detail, but I just briefly discuss. Um, about how decolonial thought then merges with uh, realist thought, especially near-realist thought. Um, but definitely those, you know, going back to Mahan, Mahan and um, Mackinder and all these mm -hmm. classical geopolitics thinkers of the early um, 20th century would be interesting in seeing how those, how those are connected to the debate. And I think Pablo has um, already written something about those. Uh, congratulations on your paper. Uh, I would like to do two quick questions. Uh, the first of them is like, uh, what's the the impact and the relevance of Samuel Huntington theory about civilizations within Putin's discourse? And why that's question, in my opinion, important? Because although some of Putin's speech seems as a decolonial critique, the weight that the issue about distinct civilizations that has cultural rooted issues that makes them different between them and that must be respected in that perspective probably has a huge impact more than the issue of a the colonial critique, which is really related to another concept, which is emancipation. And honestly, I cannot see how Putin's discourse is related 
directly for the idea of emancipation, especially if we compare about how Putin's discourse nowadays compared to the ones of the Soviet Union when he tried to address Latin American countries and African countries during the process of independence, for example. And the second issue is how do you, for example, uh, address the issue related to discourse in the reality as in the fact as, okay, if Putin does uses a decolonial discourse in order to gain attention and support internationally, but how the West misses to address real agendas from the third world or the undevelopment world, in the sense that Putin's kind of highlights being a great power and how with that he gains leverage in his discourse, although we know he acts as a great power uh, in, in his new broad. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so. What I gathered from what you just said is you, you asked about Huntington class of civilization and how that relates to uh, this civilizationism in Russian uh, foreign policy. I think it's not the same as Huntington's. Huntington is, in my view, more of a more of an extension of neorealism into civilization. So it's, it treats very polemically civilizations as these sort of unitary actors which are somehow uh, there's no, there would be no transnational networks, nothing. Um, so I don't think it's Huntingtonian um, discourse, the one in Russia. It's because in principle, I think the way Putin uses these civilizational ideas is more, uh, it respects different kinds of religious traditions, different kinds of cultural traditions. So it's not so deeply Huntingtonian in that sense. Um, but with regards to the emancipation, I believe there is an emancipatory vision in Putin's critique. It's the multipolar order, which is based on sort of uh, this sort of utopian dream world of nationalist, uh, nationalist and reactionary uh, countries. So, and they would then live happily ever after, and every every nation would be. Um, thrilled to maintain its own identity and its own uniqueness. So I think that's the emancipatory vision of Putin's multipolar order. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Did, did, you have, did you have something to say on the Huntington? I saw you were writing. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> you've just given me ideas for the chapters. Um, I think it's very much this, um, I don't know, the way emancipation always is, right? You draw a line. Uh, within which you become emancipated and and these two emancipated communities are allowed to, to be different but within that emancipated community you must be homogenous um, and that's obviously to simplify but I think that is in general uh, the productive line of the decolonial critique I think is is one of um, and it, it's not a fair reading of all of the scholars but I think this idea of kind of um, yeah, specificity that you talk about, um, like cultural specificity. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to the, the question about discourse and reality. My answer to that is going to be very different. Uh, oh, just uh, discourse is a reality, right? It's There's no question that, uh, that the construction of a decolonial discourse, as Putin is doing, is not an action, right? That is politics in itself. And it may be that it doesn't align with what you think material interests are, but that then is a difference to be explored and not one that uh, flattens the contribution of discourse analysis, I think. Um, because the reasons that these actions are able to be justified in this way, uh, that's really important. Like, what is it about the international that means that these uh, these justifications work. Why are they allowed? And it might be that you think that's uh, like there's a realist answer to that, and the answer is discourse doesn't matter because states have set interests. But who constructs those interests, and how do we decide what those are? Um, so I think I personally, my my instinct is that, or well, not my instinct, my belief is that uh, discourse is reality. But you know, um, it may be that. These actions have to be then the way in which they're justified through a kind of critical gymnastics is what's interesting, I think. Right. So how do you decide what the predefined actions of a 
uh, kind of scholarly approach on. Uh, so I don't know if that's helpful, but I. One of the privileges of moderating, moderating a debate is if, so nobody raises their hand and I can ask my question. <laughs> um, Mati, um, you start the paper as a diagnosis of critique uh, of, of a crisis of critical approaches. Um, couldn't you read this as an impact study of the opposite? So when you look at uh, decolonial approaches as a, a, a critique of Western hypocrisy and, and, and the European centric politics of knowledge and how it has been influential, but that doesn't resonate with the powerful object of, of decolonial critique. But it does have resonance on Putin. And so now you could basically argue it's, it's in a policy impact case study sense, it is actually demonstrating the success of decolonial arguments influencing policy discourse, but unfortunately not where it would matter. <laughs> so it's a, it's a critical problem solving theory sufficient or do we maybe need to clarify the underlying ethics and values of a decolonial critique more specifically? Yeah, I, I guess so. I, like I said in, in the paper, it's a uh, challenge and an opportunity. And I guess you can make the claim that decolonial theory has been a victim of its own success um, in, in this instance. And definitely, I think one of the maybe the points that I make in my paper and what Rhiannon was actually smart enough to, I wasn't smart enough to understand it myself. And you, re you read it, read my paper and gave me comments. So is that that decolonial theory doesn't necessarily have any moral content. It's just this, the way I treat it is a set of tools um, and, and certain techniques and moves, a method. And those can have different kinds of, uh, those can take different kinds of ethical meanings. Can probably do that. Um, do we have an online audience? Oh, I see. Lovely. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, so. uh, thanks Matty. Sorry I missed your talk. Um, but uh, talking about how messages land in, you know, globally with beyond the West, beyond Russia and its immediate allies, if you were talking to a Western policymaker trying to, trying to get their messages to land better with some of these sort of hedging states, these countries that, you know, align differently based on their, their individual interests and might vote, in, say, in the UN General Assembly one way or another, um, depending on a whole host of, of reasons or um, how or just how compelling they find find any given argument. What do you think those sorts of people, those, those policymakers could take from your paper in terms of how they how they frame those sorts of arguments. Um, should they kind of try and beat Putin at his own game? Should they double down with a very different argument? Should they go somewhere in between? Um, what do you think? Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, first of all, I would say we, I think pol policymakers should pay more attention to the language they use. I, I was in, in Munich at a NATO workshop recently, and I was struck by how they used southern um, Southern European NATO member states like to use the word NATO Southern flank. So even that is, I think, an interesting term to describe the sort of security order, is that, because that implies that there is a sort of security threat coming, uh, an imminent threat coming from its sort of Southern flank and there's a war going. So I think those kinds of the concepts are that we use in, in political debates, they really matter because they are, they are received in your sort of they are received differently by different audiences and i think that requires us to be more mindful of how those kinds of messages resonate in those contexts like you said and perhaps one of the ways is to, is to sort of challenge this kind of idea that for example international relations theory is kind of sort of objective scientific way of studying internationally there's no objective or neutral concepts and the most dominant concepts we use are often very realist or neorealist and these are often masqueraded as sort of somehow scientific, um, although they are very much largely a product of the United States political science in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, so definitely that's something to bear in mind. I think, yeah, I don't know. What do you think yourself? You're, you're, you're working on these issues. Yeah, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I'm undecided, actually. I think, uh, I think there's one argument which says, there's one argument which says that by engaging with some of the arguments Putin makes, we're, we're playing sort of to his advantage. And then there's another argument which says that, well, many of these, the reason many of these states identify with some of, and, and sort of, yeah, identify with some of these arguments that he's making and they, they sort of have such weight with them is that they are, they've experienced colonial uh, violence, some, some very extreme themselves, and they naturally can sort of see the appeal of some of the, the, the arguments he's using, even if, even if the physical manifestation is, is perhaps one that they might not immediately approve of. Um, I'm not, I, I'm genuinely not sure. Um, I think we, we, in the West generally, we kind of leap between the two. We, we sometimes, um, we sometimes say, no, no, that's complete nonsense. And then other times we, we sort of give it, give it some credit and, and adjust our behavior. And I, and I don't know if we do that in a coherent or kind of, thought out way. I think it's a bit ad hoc. Thanks. Um, just to jump on that, I think there seems to be a bit of a, like a, a business model um, element to this because as Pablo said, um, you know, Russia and authoritarian states can fund state uh, media and co-fund co uh, media, um, whereas there's a bit of a void, um, especially in the global south, like in Africa, where there's just simply not enough investment in local media um, to hire quality journalists to, you know, so often you have these, um, you know, kind of copy um, outlets that simply just syndicate, you know, copy and paste stuff straight from Sputnik and, and Russia Today. Um, and it is, you know, interesting to see how, especially in the Sahal um, areas like Mali, with the French and the US uh, presence diminishing, um, how you know China and, and Russia are more than happy to fill that space um, and definitely position themselves as well. You know we didn't colonize um, any countries in Africa, um, so that we can almost position themselves as a as an ally. Um, so I think there's there's maybe a case there for kind of investment and it's maybe more on the commercial side not not theoretical but you know what 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 role and responsibility do media buyers have um you could even argue like google and some of the tech companies um and then i was also just wondering um you know a lot of leaders um i, I can look at south africa for example um in, in the ruling um anc were were trained um by the, by the soviets so they they almost have that um you know theoretical thought um kind of that's that's how they, they, they learned and um BRICS was recently hosted in, in Johannesburg and there's a lot of discussion about uh, BRICS expansion and um I guess this kind of falls into to what you're talking about this more multipolar um world and yeah I was just wondering if you could have you have you um looked into kind of Africa um and the global south and just around that those kind of topics uh, what I can say, what I've been reading into recently is how in sort of Russian intellectual traditions, what's the understanding of war and what is the Russian way of war, especially when it comes to information and, and knowledge. And I, I'm of the opinion that maybe in the West, there's an inside NATO and uh, military planners and decision makers, there's this idea that war is very conventional, traditional militaries against militaries. But then if you look into Russian traditions of uh, strategic thought, like Mesner and others, and there's this small sort of, there's a whole, it's a completely different kind of understanding of what war is. It's, it's war where um, your soldiers on the ground in the battlefield are not the only troops. The troops are your enemies, uh, social movements and social forces, and you try to um, insert ideas into those uh, societies that then create the revolution from within. So these kinds of conceptions are certainly... Hmm? I think he uses those ideas as well. Yeah. And and bunch of other um, 
Russian military thinkers as well. So I think that's something maybe to think about as well, is that if, should we kind of try to think war differently? And that way we can sort of start, when we start asking the right questions, then we can come up with proper answers. Yeah. Um, it's kind of questions, kind of uh, opinion, but <clears throat> what do you think? Does West need to change the policy towards what I mean, the situation what we have today? And we know after the Cold War how the West were kind of released and uh, relaxed and thought, okay, main problem, main um, enemies is not there anymore. And now it's time for peace. But on the other hand, as I've seen uh, for my research, Russia constantly have been working and preparing what we have today. But thanks corruption in Russia, they are not well prepared. Otherwise, maybe we would have their tanks in London, in Berlin, in many uh, Western European states. And uh, I agree when um, we see Russian propaganda, they are very coherent. They know what they are doing, what messages they need to send. And on the other hand, in the West, which I much uh, appreciate because it's a democracy and it's very important to discuss and have a different opinion in the academia, in media and many different places. But actually, it makes very, very confusion many people. And uh, one of the survey, which was, for example, made in Ukraine, Eastern, Europe, Eastern Ukrainians, when they studied uh, why they support Russian narratives, actually, they found out, like, because they give very direct opinion and uh, very clear ideas of what Russians want to do, and they don't have any debates in, for example, in the studio, in uh, talk shows and so on. It's kind of work like that. People believe what they listen. And on the other hand, uh, Western uh, Ukrainians, when they uh, were asked some the same questions, they could not answer. Um, what actually uh, their thought was, because um, mainly they are confused, because, yeah, I know, we have a debate about uh, the problems, you have one opinion, another and another, and they can't come up, especially people who don't have enough education and can't analyze. So we have this kind of problem today. From my point of view, education is a main important tool for the future, long term um, for long term approach. But right now we have a real problem. It's very great to discuss about these theories, analyzing what these theories are talking about. But reality is completely different and very dangerous, by the way. So what do you think? What we need to do in the West to give clear ideas for not just um, people in so-called third world, but even in Western societies? Because I'm quite sure many people in Western, yeah, Western European countries are mainly confused, even when you ask, what this war means for you in Ukraine. They don't consider this war as a threat from uh, our uh, democracy in the West because they think it's somewhere, not um, nothing to do for us. But I think people who don't have an idea how democracy, how, how hard it is to build the democracy, it's very, and they also don't have an idea how easy it is to destroy it. Mm -hmm. I think they can't understand what kind of dangerous situation we face today. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would say my, my paper looks into how, as part of that broader conflict, how Putin uses or criticizes the, the West and, and those communication uh, tools 
strategic narratives are very, very effective. And not only in Russia, but in the West among the new right and some fringes of the left as well. And I think it's very interesting to see how that also impacts in the UN General Assembly and how how Putin has been able to create this war or frame this war in and globally as a sort of very parochial conflict in the West as well. And that doesn't very much interest, um, it doesn't have that much interest globally. And that's that you can see when you look at different African countries' responses to the war. And they even, some of them even support it and see it as a sort of decolonizing effort or de-westernizing effort to change the international order. But yeah, like you said, and what you're doing in your PhD research is very important work, and but we we have very different research questions and research interests. And well, of course, we different. need to study different things. <laughs> but you people study one thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, me again. Uh, I'd like to do another two questions, if if it's possible. Uh, in to thank you for the excellent debate. The first of them, based on what you said, is would you consider Russian traditional uh, Erasianism theories as the colonial? That would be the first question, based on what you answered. And departing from the, uh, our colleague question here about Russian warfare and thinking, well, what you described about the Russian way of warfare, doesn't the US does the same? Because what you all described is what we call like the combination of the national instruments of power, time, like diplomatic, informational, economic, etc., and the military also, in order to achieve political effects. In that way, the West does the same thing, meaning the, way you, the, the US. And sometimes, for good, for example, I'm from Brazil, last year we had elections, and the US uh, uh, discourse about not accepting the military's role or the disruption of democ democracy there was really important for the stabilization of the democratic process there. Well, so that's a medal in a domestic foreign nation affair. Well, in that sense, what's the difference? in terms of the practice related to the use of broader power instruments to create political uh, intended objectives. Thank you. Thanks, those are excellent questions. With regards to the first one on Eurasianism, whether I think it's decolonial, I would say that in those discourses and how, how I also understand what decolonial means is, you know, it has those three characteristics. It can be void of any normative or ethical content. It, if, it's, if it has something meaningful to say, about Western dominance and Western colonization of other cultures and other nations, if it has something meaningful to say about indigenous traditions and indigenous cultures, and if it has something meaningful to say about emancipatory order or a new sort of a roadmap for an emancipatory future, then it's decolonial. So if I think you should you can um, you can assess decoloniality of Eurasianism through that lens. Um, with regards to the Russian way of war and way, whether it links to um, also, or it's very similar to Western instruments of warfare, economic information, yeah, which ones you list? Yes, right. um, that's very interesting and that's a good point. I would say that based on my um, reading, a colleague in the department actually, Offer Friedman's book on Russian hybrid warfare was very um, important to my thinking in regards to Russian way of war and how how in the um, 2010s, when when I believe it was 2010s, when uh, NATO came up with this concept concept of strategic communications, around the same time, a con similar parallel concept emerged in Russian military thinking, which is information war. Um, and I think Offer Friedman shows very well in that book how these are very different. Um, I guess in the in in the Western mind, there is this idea that strategic communications is better essentially propaganda and it's about it's about saying something it's about writing it's it's text whereas in maybe in russian way of war information war which is the parallel concept it's more also about actions and how you can you can do something which creates a response in your enemy country which leads to certain kinds of political debates and and creating the conditions that are suitable for your overall strategic aims um, and this is an example, I believe, for example, and the way Russia is, um, has been modernizing its Arctic uh, 
um, military infrastructure um, in Western think tank um, analysis of Russia in the Arctic there's this tendency to assume that Russia is this great power in the Arctic and it has been slowly and skillfully played everyone in the West while it has been modernizing its Arctic infrastructure and they they these these analysts talk about how there are new military bases and new air bases in the Arctic. Whereas in reality, if you look at these um, uh, these developments, it seems that these are just tiny airstrips with a with a with a janitor's building in them. So these are kind of interesting ways of just by acting in somehow you can create this interesting response, which makes Russia seem very scary and and a great power um, in Western analysis. So. I would say with regards to the Russian way of war and information war, I think there are some subtle differences there and those are worth exploring definitely further. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have to say I'm not entirely convinced, but um, uh, so there are a couple of gaps which I would um, draw to your attention. One of them is uh, the whole issue of human rights and particularly uh, treaty-based human rights. Uh, and I would argue that the apogee of human rights was the Helsinki Final Act in 1975, which was partly used against Russia. It was not a, it was not the only raison d'etre, but it was actually used against Russia. Uh, and the Russians remember that. And also the, the increasing um, marginalization of human rights through the, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention, uh, uh, which has actually undermined human rights all over. Uh, Many of the countries you talk about uh, are not only have not only uh, experienced colonialism with colonies, but also have uh, experienced post-colonial intervention, including, of course, America's near abroad, uh, which has always been a near abroad since the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, I mean, arguably, America's intervened more in its own near abroad than Russia has. So uh, th there are these kind of uh, gaps, and then then there's the other issue of. Uh, globalization and its uh, uneven effect over the years, including a, a rapid fall in commodity prices in the 70s and 80s, which is partly being reversed. But uh, the, the, uh, uh, then there are other wars which are taking place, uh, sanctions, uneven uh, imposition of sanctions. No sanctions have ever been imposed on Israel, for example. Um, the uh, uh, the economic war, which is taking shape uh, with access to minerals, part part of the part of the un, un, unknown war, is is over access to minerals, uh, and th these are all factors which uh, I think need a bit more attention. Right. So your first point about human rights and treaty-based human rights. This is exactly what I talk about in my paper and what I discussed earlier during my presentation. Is that how in Putin's critique of international order. He, he uses this idea that human rights are universal principles, but they take different meanings in different societies. And that's his, that's his way of um, critiquing the West and labeling anything that the West does, for example, funding um, democratic movements in Russia as a national security threat, because it's, it's a violation of Russian sovereignty and its um, sort of cultural integrity. So I'm not really, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by gaps uh, in your question. And the second, second uh, topic, the humanitarian interventions and their responsibility to protect. Um, this is exactly also related to this question because in, in Putin's critique, this is, this is exactly what he does. He says, and rightfully so, that these humanitarian, um, um, for example, in his Munich, 2007 Munich Security Conference speech. He talks about humanitarian interventions as a sort of neo-imperialist neo mask for dominating other countries. This is exactly what Putin says as well. And so I was quite surprised by your sort of pointing out the gaps because I'm not really I'm not really sure what you were referring to. We'll have time to uh, discuss afterwards. We have two more um, questions on my list, and then I would suggest after that we're going to close the list of questions. Um, not so much a, a question, but I actually just wanted to add on from your comment on what you were saying about the um, information war. So I, I, I just um, finished Stratcom with 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 Neville Bolt, um, and um, 
and 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 read um off his book the the hybrid warfare it's really good um and just as you were saying i think um where you know in the west they li- they like to see things in these kind of silo departments you know like the pentagon will deal with military things and um and the state department will deal with foreign affairs and stuff like that um come, comes back to our kind of western um linear thought we like to have predefined definitions and um and and kind of you know think in rational terms whereas i think in the in the russian uh, thought they place a lot more emphasis on 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 the on the context and the situation and kind of like why would you have predefined um uh, when you talk of strategy you know why would you have predefined goals when the context can change so much and i think that emphasis on on information and you said it's not just text and words but actions ultimately knowing that um the main target is the psychological and everything ends up being uh, a psychological decision uh, so that 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 main target i guess information not being a passive medium but a strategic tool um yeah just just wanted to, to add on that i i agree and i i suspect uh, what i've been for my phd research i've been trying to sort of pinpoint where did that sort of sort of siloed rationalist thinking where did that emerge from and i believe it's it's in american political science it's some this interesting development that happened in the 50s and 60s with the behavioral revolution in the social sciences and how you think that the social world can be studied the same way as as a natural sciences studies uh, the human body for example or the laws of physics and and i think there's something maybe went wrong there if this is so ingrained in sort of western western thought and like i said earlier when i attended this workshop in munich a couple of weeks ago that uh, basic I was quite surprised. It was the audience was uh, a couple of PhD students, some young professionals, and masters master students across Europe. The reading list was 15 foreign affairs articles. So a very narrow um, narrow scope of literature, very narrow epistemic uh, very narrow epistemic parameters of where you draw uh, debate or you can debate from. Especially if you think that foreign affairs debates are mostly rooted in maybe neorealist thought or liberal internationalist or liberal institutionalist sort of theoretical underpinning so i think that's something that we need to need to think of where we what kind of sort of epistemologies and ontologies we we subscribe to when we analyze the world and that's really important when it comes to uh russian foreign policy as well you can't really you can't really um change the tire of a car with a chainsaw you know you need you need proper tools to do that and you need to look at the context um, what kind of tools you use to analyze them. And let's not forget that the history of the journal foreign affairs is quite pertinent in this case as well. Yeah, great presentation, Maddie. It was good to hear more about this one. Um, so I just had two questions. Maybe the first is more a point, but I'm sure there's a question somewhere in there. <laughs> but it seems to me what you're doing, and we've kind of chatted about this before, that you're almost abstracting away from certain decolonial and critical thinkers to discern, I guess, the more generic features of what makes something decolonial, if I'm reading this right. So my thinking here um, is, can we identify then, say, previous examples of reactionary or far-right revolutionary decolonial projects, right? So I'm thinking here of like David Motadel's work on, say, this reactionary Berlin International during the 1930s. Does that also match this sort of scaffolding that you've created here? Um, and that, I guess, would be slightly anachronistic, right? Because that would be obviously prior to the advent a lot of this thought. Um, But then to bring this more towards your project itself, I'm wondering also if we can discern whether there are direct intellectual roots between, say, these decolonial thinkers and critical thinkers and, say, this Putinist project. Um, And again, this is something we kind of chatted about previously, where I think doing the jump from, say, think tanks to Putin is the tricky thing, right? Obviously, Putin's not going to be name dropping people or necessarily citing um, thinkers and the like. But I wonder if, uh, and I'm not sure if you go into this in the paper itself, but whether, say, going into the likes of Dugan or these Russian think tanks, these people are citing and they do name drop if they are drawing on either critical thinkers and scholars, say, in the 1960s, 1970s, or also when this discourse transfers into IR, if they're also drawing on them. Because I can think of, in the case of Dugan, there is weird references that he makes, for example, to John Hobson, um, not the imperialism one, the, the younger living one, right? Which is very interesting, whether you can identify clear 
you know, a reception history of sorts. So I'm wondering if you also engage in that intellectual history component, or if it's more you abstract away, define this concept, and then compare it in a sense. Um, so I'm sure there was a question in there. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, well, this is Kai Allender, one. He's a historian of the 1930s, so he, he, can, he can probably, you can answer your first question. Well, <laughs> um, but with regards to the second on the sort of methodology, I'm, um, I, it, well, it's not very, it's not thick sociologically. I'm, I'm not able to very strongly make, make arguments that these are like, okay, Putin met with this person here, or Putin read this text here, or cites this person. And that's, that's not the point. The paper is more, uh, more conceptual, whether there's sort of, whether there's the tools of, tools of decolonial critique are present in Putin's, Putin's thought as well. I do some sort of historical sociology as well. And so that I can claim that these sort of, like like I mentioned earlier, Natalia Narochnitskaya, a former Russian diplomat and a conspiracy theorist later on, um, and then Surkov, who was who was uh, so-called the chief ideologue of the Kremlin uh, in in the early or mid 2000s, and how these people's articles and and books and thoughts are then sort of present also in Putin's discourse. So this. It's quite thin sociologically, I'll give you that. But my uh, my key argument is more with regards to the decolonial tools of critique more generally, rather than actual studying networks and the sociology of knowledge so much. But yeah, that's a that's a good point. And the the sociology aspect is more my PhD research is more on this sort of thicker sociological side of things. But that's a that's a fair comment. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. Thank you so much. We can continue the conversation in a more informal way. Before we do that, let me thank the School of Security Studies EDI team for organizing this, um, um, this series of events, notably Alan Hallams and Eleanor Russell, who have been organizing behind the scenes. I would like to thank all of you for your thoughtful contributions and most of all, of course, Rhiannon and Maddie. So please join me in a round of applause. Thank you.